All right, so actually I'm going to talk about lab three right now, just based on the ones I've graded already. Um, and then I want to talk about the midterm, and then we don't have a lecture on Thursday because Thursday is the midterm. So, um, so I want to go through lab three now. Just a few things. Which most people have turned in. So, um, experiment one, you were building three different circuits and you were asked to analyze them. Um, this first circuit is, is a straightforward LED hookup, right? We have five volts on the left. We have a 1K resistor to limit the current. We have an LED facing in the right direction. The other end goes to ground. That's going to light up the LED. It's going to be nice and bright, okay? Configuration two, we have an inverter with the input tied to low, so that's connected to ground. If you put zero into an inverter, the output should be logic one. That should be around five volts. So we should still have five volts going into our LED to a resistor and to ground. Changing the resistor from the left side to the right side makes no difference. Okay, resistors in series, um, doesn't matter where you put them. The current will be the same everywhere. But instead of connecting the input of the LED to five volts directly, it's coming from the output of this inverter. And if you build these side by side and look, you're going to notice the LED is not as bright in this configuration because there's not as much current coming out of that inverter as there is coming out of the power supply. So you'll see the LED still turn on, but it'll probably be noticeably a little dimmer. This third configuration is really strange because we have five volts on the right, a 1K resistor, our LED. If this point in our circuit right here was connected to ground, we'd expect the LED to turn on, but it's actually connected to the output of an inverter, which is normally a strange thing to do. But the input of the inverter is tied to logic one, so the output should be logic zero, which is close to ground. So electrically, this is working almost the same as if we had this point actually connected to ground, and we should just have the LED turning on. Five volts, resistor, LED, ground. So in configuration three, your LED should also light up, but again, it should not be as bright as configuration one. All right, a uh, reminder here, if you put figures into your lab report that are not your own, you've got to cite them. You've got to say this is from uh, 250 lab write up three, or this is from HTTPS, CNGRCS.com slash, or something like that, or this is from the lab that our teacher gave us, right? You got to at least put something in there so that people don't think you're claiming that you wrote this, okay? Because if you put that in a report and you publish it and someone comes forward and says, hey, that's my drawing, right? Now you're guilty of plagiarism. And that gets into all kinds of, of issues. So just a basic citation saying at the bottom of the figure taken from, you know, lab assignment three or something like that is enough to, to keep you off the hook for that. Um, same thing with circuit two. So circuit two is a quirky circuit that kind of builds on what happened in circuit one. Um, so suppose the switch is closed, okay, so switch is a zero, so if the switch is closed it tells us the switch is a zero and we know that's true if we close this connection from here to here this input is going to be pulled down to ground that's a logic zero. Zero goes into an inverter, the output is a one. So this point right here is a logic one. So five volts goes through an LED resistor to ground, LED should turn on. So L2 should be on, that's a logic one. So this is one, which is on. Well, this is five volts here, goes through an inverter, this becomes logic zero, that's like zero volts. And this is the circuit that we had in the previous experiment. Five volts, resistor, LED, zero volts, L1 should turn on. So this entry in your truth table is also a one. If the switch is open, which is a logic one, 
logic one goes into an inverter, output is logic zero. This point is ground. Now we have L2, there's ground over here, there's a resistor, there's ground over here, there's no current flow. Both ends are connected to the same voltage. Current only flows when there's a difference in voltage. Without current going through L2, it stays off. So this is a logic zero. And since this is a logic zero over here, zero gets inverted, becomes a one, this becomes five volts at this point. This is also five volts through a resistor. Both ends of the LED are at the same voltage. Again, there's no current flow. No current flow, the LED is off. Off is a logic zero. So this is a logic zero. So there's the truth table you get, and it's just a, a really wonky like inverter. Right? It takes in a zero, gives you a one, takes in a one, gives you a zero on both LEDs. All right, and I don't have anything to say on experiment three yet. I gotta finish grading them. So, but that's just the three circuits, three sets of equations and all that stuff. And then you get a working traffic light at the end. Yeah? Is there any practical application to having the LED flow the other way into the output of an inverter? Or is that just kind of a something to be aware of? Yeah. Before the quarter is over, you'll probably see a practical application for it. You'll probably discover a practical application for it. So keep it, keep it in your back of your brains, and you'll probably find a chance to use this. All right. Um, want to talk about the midterm? So I posted a, a list of topics to think about, but there's nothing really insightful in here. It's really just kind of a rehash of what we've been doing. Um, so things to think about. Um, so digital versus analog, right? That's where this all started. So analog was things that sort of move continuously between, say, different voltage levels. Digital, we sort of split things into these big bins. This is high, this is low. Um, you definitely have a question dealing with binary numbers. So converting between decimal and binary, converting between binary and decimal. Um, including negative numbers. So if I say to use two's complement and you have a negative number, you gotta flip all the bits and add one. Um, if I say to work with four bit, Two's complement, make sure you use four bits everywhere. Even if you're just dealing with the number one, put down zero, 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 one, so it's four bits. If it's eight bits, zero, 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 one. Right? Takes a little longer to write, but it's really important when you have two's complement involved. Um, so you'll definitely have some questions converting between binary and decimal, um, converting into hex or octal. Um, and doing arithmetic with binary numbers, including using two's complement to do subtraction. So you've had homework questions on these. Okay, so review those. Um, you will definitely have questions that require you to, to write diagrams for switches and LEDs. Okay, LEDs are pretty straightforward. It's just um, make sure you always have a 1K resistor somewhere either before or after and usually when we make LEDs we have the output side connected to ground and so the arrow, the triangle points towards ground, right? So that's the right direction for an LED and you could have the resistor over here. Um, side note, I've seen this in a few of the labs. Suppose you have an inverter I'll put a circle around the LED just to make it look better. This is not the same thing as this. Let's say that's X. Right, this is taking the thing that's going into the inverter and it's putting a resistor in series. That's what you want to do. 
This is doing some other thing. This is actually limiting the input current to an inverter, something we usually don't want to do. And then the output of the inverter is going straight through the LED without any resistor. That's definitely something we don't want to do. So resistors can get moved around in series, but this is not a simple series circuit. You've got a bunch of stuff going in here. You've got a dozen transistors and other parts between this point and this point. So if you want that resistor to be in series with the LED, it's got to be right before or right after the LED. Right, having the, the logic gate in there does something totally different. So be sure how to wire up LEDs and then switches. I'll draw this one more time. Right, there's a good switch. So the voltage at this point is going to be 5 volts if you're open, 0 volts if you're closed. So it lets you get a logic 1 or a logic 0. Alright, you should know about logic gates like ANDs and ORs and NANDs and NORs and XORs and XNORs and inverters. That's what we've been playing with the whole course so far, so you're, you're familiar with those. Um, main thing we're going to do with those, we're going to either start with a truth table and try to turn that into an equation and then sketch a circuit to go with the equation or go in the other direction. Start with a circuit, write an equation from the circuit and then turn it, that into a truth table. So going from a truth table to an equation, that's writing a sum of products or a product of sums or using a K-map to simplify it. And then once you have an equation, writing a circuit is really just, you know, here's two things anded together, I need an AND gate. The output of that gets ORed with this, I need an OR gate, I'll connect the output of that to the input of the OR gate, I'll connect the other thing to the input, and so on. In the reverse direction, if you're starting with a circuit, here's an AND gate, the inputs are X and Q, so the output of that is X, what did I say, AND, ANDed with Q. And you figure out what each of the points in your circuit is in terms of an equation of involving the inputs until you get to the final output. Now you can say that output equals blah, the long equation of the inputs. Theorem proving is just a fancy way of saying show that two things are the same in all cases. So I think we did this with De Morgan's theorem. But if you've got some function of say a, b, and c, and you've got some other function of a, b, and c, if you find all possible values of a, b, and c, and in each of those cases f and g always have the same value as each other, that means f and g are the same function. So we could prove De Morgan's theorem, for example, like this. We could write down, you know, A or B or C with a bar on top. And over here we could write A bar, anded with B bar, anded with C bar. And you're going to find that the values of those two expressions are exactly the same, no matter what A, B, and C are. And once you've seen that, you can say, okay, so this expression is equivalent to that expression. We play with this a hundred different ways when we get to CSE 215 discrete structures. So this will all come back in glorious fashion later. All right, so you should know how to do sums of products and product of sums by looking at the truth table, either writing min terms for the ones or writing max terms for the zeros and summing together the min terms or multiplying the max terms. Um, And the, the compact form is when you just say, you know, sigma, and you list them in terms that you're adding together. A full form is when you actually write out, you know, A, B bar, C, or A bar, B, C, that kind of thing. Um, and remember, if there's a, a compact form, I didn't do this to you on the test, but for future reference.
right? That MD means that those are don't cares. So the row corresponding to min terms two and six would have a dash in it in the truth table. And those pop up when you're you're trying to minimize with a K map dashes are useful. Um, and we'll talk about that in 30 seconds. Um, so minimization, you can minimize algebraically, but I'm, I'm mostly interested in minimizing with k-maps. But if you combine things, you can cancel things out. You can use the adjacency theorem, you can use distribution, you can use some of the identities and simplify things, but we're focused on using k-maps. So um, what do you want to know about k-maps? Basically, if you're doing a sum of products, you fill in all the ones from your truth table. If you're doing a product of sums, you fill in all the zeros. Okay, whichever ones you're filling, you want to cover those with rectangles. So let's say we're doing a product of sums. And let's say those are all the zero terms. And you want to use as large rectangles as possible. You want to use as few rectangles as possible. You need to cover every zero. You're allowed to cover zeros more than once, but you have to cover them at least once. You're not required to cover dashes, but you're allowed to. You're not allowed to cover ones. And your rectangles have to have sides of length either one, two, or four, power of two. So if I was going to cover this, well, this dash is really useful. Let me throw another dash in here. Right? This dash is really useful because I can make a 2 by 2 rectangle that covers those three zeros. I could cover this dash and this zero with a little 1 by 2 rectangle. There's no reason to do that because this zero is already covered. This doesn't have to be covered. If I put a rectangle here, I'm just introducing more hardware. Right? Once that zero is covered, I'm done. Okay, I still have to cover these zeros. Well, I can't do a 3 by t 1, right? But I can do this split rectangle piece. So there's another 2 by 2 that picks up those. And then I got one little zero hanging off here at the end. Well, I can pair it up with one other zero and get a slightly bigger rectangle. So that would probably be the optimal covering of the zeros for that particular K-map. All right, so make your rectangles. Remember that they wrap on the edges. And remember also that you can wrap your four corners. All right, if those are all ones, you can tie them together in a big rectangle. And then these correspond to this peculiar ordering of bit numbers zero 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 one 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 and then one zero and so you write down the term corresponding to each of these rectangles so for this um, two by two that's split across here a could be zero or one b has to be zero c could be zero or one so we don't care about it and d has got to be one so we want a max term corresponding to b equals 0 and d equals 1. Well, max terms, if we have something equal to 0, we write it without a bar. If we have something equal to 1, we write it with a bar. And for max terms, we're oring them together. So that's b or d bar. If those are 1s and we were doing min terms, it would be b bar added with d. So that's just something to keep straight. Put it on your note sheets. Um, put an example or something that helps you remember it. So it'll definitely be K-maps. Um, and XORs are just, you know, if you have a checkerboard pattern, you can't make anything bigger than a one-by-one one rectangle sometimes. And so those are big uh, terms, lots of logic involved, but sometimes you can turn those into XORs. And we don't have a, a methodical way to do that, but if you're building a circuit and you see a checkerboard, which you'll see in your half adder, full adder, um, think about XORs.
Uh, complete list of NANs and NORs, so you got homework on that you're working on, and we talked about basically you can build anything from NANs, you can build anything from NORs, but that's really it. So AND gates don't get you inverters, OR gates don't get you inverters, inverters don't get you ANDs, and XORs will get you inverters, but you can't get ANDs and ORs out of XORs. So NANs and NORs are kind of special. Uh, multiplexers and demultiplexers. So multiplexers take a bunch of inputs and choose which one to connect to an output. Demultiplexers go the other direction. Uh, 74LS47 is the decoder for seven segment display. And I won't ask you about a priority encoder, but we talked about that a little bit. And brush up on your half adder, full adder. Right, you're gonna have to do it for your lab anyway. Um, full adder takes two bits and an incoming carry, generates a sum and outgoing carry. Half adder is just a full adder where the incoming carry is always zero. So it's a slightly simpler circuit. And the punchline with full adders is you can string them up side by side, take the output from one carry, feed it to the carry end of the next, and you can build an n bit adder using that. So they're a useful way to do addition. And you can trick them to be multipliers too, or uh, subtractors. So you got five questions, 20 points each. Um, some on numbers and number conversion and um, binary hex octal kinds of things, two's complement. Um, you'll have a design question where you're going from a description of a circuit to the final circuit, um, similar to the homework that you just got back. Um, there'll be KMAP questions, there'll be a section of short answer questions. Um, I don't know what the fifth problem was, I don't remember. So the half adder, full adder, we're not going to know, or we're not going to need to know like the circuitry behind it, but we need to know the concept, right? You should know the concept, but theoretically I could ask you to come up with that circuitry, right? So if, if you know what a full adder does, you can write a truth table for it. And once you got a truth table, you can come up with equations and then sketch a circuit. So two pages of double-sided notes are allowed. Um, you can write them by hand, you can print them on a computer, you can take the whole book and shrink it down to fit on two pages, that's fine. Um, eight and a half by eleven pages. I'm not super picky about notes, I'm not trying to force you to predict what I'm going to ask and decide what to put on your notes, but I don't want it to be open book because open book inevitably people spend most of the time flipping through the book looking for, right, or flipping through their notes. So the stuff that, that, go back over your homeworks, go back over the labs, go back over the key concepts, and um, the stuff that you're not sure you can do with your eyes closed, right, review on, and if you need to look things up, I can't remember if some of products is, is the pluses or the dots, right? Put something on your note sheet to jog your memory. I don't know what compact midterm form is, I can never remember that, right? Put something on your notes to jog your memory. And you can, you can develop your note sheets throughout a course, typically, right? A good way to do homeworks is, is to, um, you know, come from lecture and try to put down the relevant points on, on a condensed sheet and try to do your homework assignments just from that sheet. And that'll help you figure out, you know, this is something that I really need to put on here because I can't remember it. Or, you know, I never look at this thing that I wrote down because I've done it so much, it's, it's second nature to me. I don't need the truth table for an OR gate because I know what an OR gate is now. So take that off your note sheet. You can sort of develop it as you go. Um, so when you get to your exam, you got like the ideal note sheet for yourself. So any questions about any of that? Like I say, I'm not intending any surprises. Should be doable in 50 minutes, but definitely pace yourself. Okay, the short answer question should not take you 10 minutes. So 
you know, five questions, 50 minutes, it's 10 minutes a question. Well, the short answer ones shouldn't take you 10 minutes. So you got a little more than 10 minutes a question for the other questions. Um, converting things to binary and, and decimal and so on and so forth, if you don't feel like you're very fast with that, just spend some time practicing. Right, take an hour and just do conversion after conversion after conversion so that you don't get caught up on what steps do I do here, which end do I start with, that kind of thing. Get that as much second nature as possible and that shouldn't take 10 minutes. Right? The design question where you're actually doing a whole circuit like you did on this last homework, that might take you more than 10 minutes. That might take 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on how quickly you think about this stuff. So budget your time. Okay, 50 minutes is not that long. Um, and my plan will be um, to probably start the exam like um, 12, 10, because some people are coming from across campus and it takes a few minutes to get here. So we'll, we'll spend the first 10 minutes just kind of chilling or answering questions or whatever. We'll do the exam from say 12, 10 to one, and then take a break at one, and then we'll start some lecture after that, or talk about the midterm if you want. Make sense? So any other questions or concerns on midterm? Or anything else up to this point? All right. Well, let's... Um, so there's no PLAs on the midterm, by the way. Right, you got PLA stuff on your homework, and and um, it'll be coming up later in some labs, but no programmable logic questions on the midterm. I'm curious about something. All these on lab five. All right. Well, let's um, let's change gears here. So um, we've been designing circuits like this. We have some inputs going in. We have some outputs coming out. So we can call this A, B, C, and we can call this W, X, Y. And we've been able to define the behavior of these things so far with a truth table, which basically lists all combinations of inputs A, B, C, and for each of those tells us the values of the outputs W, X, Y. And this represents a class of circuits that we can call combinational circuits. So what's a combinational circuit? The output depends on the particular combination of the inputs. You can come to me in the year 5000 and say A is 1, B is 0, C is 1, and I can tell you immediately what the value of W is from my truth table. So that's one category of circuits, but there's a whole other category of circuits. This is where we're going to do the rest of this course. Um, is deal with these kinds of circuits, and these are called sequential circuits. So combinatorial circuits depend on, well, the combination of inputs. Sequential circuits depend on the sequence of the inputs. So what did we do in that one statement? We just introduced time into the equation. We just moved from algebra to calculus. We just moved from a picture to a movie, right? 
time is now an issue. And if you tell me A is 1, B is 0, C is 1, what's the value of W? My answer is I don't know. What was the value of A before it became a 1? Was it always a 1? Or did it used to be a 0? And when it was a 0, what was the value of B? And maybe for how long was the value of C a 0? So the order in which these things take on different values is now important to us. Which means that in some sense there's a memory somewhere. If A, B, and C are all zero, maybe W is equal to zero. But now maybe I set C equal to one, and then I set C equal to zero, and suddenly W is equal to one. And in both cases, my inputs are all zero, but in this case, W is zero. In this case, now W is a one. Why did W become a 1 here? Because at some point C was temporarily a 1. So we can't just look at the values of the inputs, we have to look at the history of the inputs. And in some sense the circuit is remembering what the inputs were in previous points in time. And that's affecting the circuit's output. So these are sequential, cir sequential circuits. And most of the interesting circuits are sequential. In fact, non-sequential circuits, combinational circuits, we can just build those with a big multiplexer. We saw how to do that last week. Just tie the inputs of a MUX to ones or zeros, and you got a combinational circuit, any combinational circuit you want. Doesn't matter how many inputs, doesn't matter how much the output is toggling between zero and one, it's just a big lookup table, it's a truth table. But sequential circuits, that's a whole other matter. Sequential circuits let us build things like computers, right? A laptop is a classic sequential circuit. What happens when I, I press on a space bar? Well, it depends what I've done in the past. If I press a space bar right here, it does this little countdown and it takes a picture of my screen. But if I do a control all right arrow first and I hit a space bar, it doesn't do anything. Right, it's a classic example of sequential behavior. So we need a few things to go forward down this path. One is we're going to need a way to analyze circuits whose behavior depends on more than just the values of the inputs. And this is something we started to look at when we talked a little about glitches, which is the idea of a timing diagram. So a typical timing diagram, we could show our inputs on a timeline. And we could show the value of an output. So this is time running in this direction, not Tim, time. And so we might say A is going to be 0, and B is going to be 0, and C is 0, and W is equal to 0. And then maybe at this point C raises to a 1, and then it comes back down to a 0. And when this happens, maybe W raises to a 1. So these are inputs. And the sequential behavior is just this. If I look at this point in time, inputs are 0, output is 0. If I look at this point in time, inputs are 0, output is 1. That tells you something's going on more than just combinational. And if I look at the full timing diagram, I can see that output changed from a 0 to 1 when my input C first went to a 1 and then came back down to a 0. And maybe at this point, B raises to a 1, and maybe my output starts doing this. That would be a cool circuit. So timing diagrams are useful when we want to analyze truth tables that change over time, basically. So we'll, we'll draw some timing diagrams and do some things with them.
so ultimately we need a memory we need a piece of circuitry that can remember something so let me draw a funny little circuit simple circuit and let me make a timing diagram timing diagrams it's hard to know kind of where to start sometimes you just make an assumption and so I don't know if I build this circuit and I measure the voltage at point X, I don't know if that's going to be high or low. So I'm just going to assume, let's suppose that X is low. What is Y's value going to be? High. It's going to be high because it's the output of an inverter whose input is low. Well, if Y is high, what happens to X? X is going to become high. And there's propagation delay here, so when X is high, it's going to take a little while for the inverter to respond to that, but eventually the inverter is going to say, hey, my input's high, I'm going to set my output to be low. And when Y is low, that's going to cause X to be low. And eventually, that's going to cause the inverter's output Y to go high. And when Y goes high, X becomes high because it's connected to it through a wire. And eventually, after X has been high for long enough, the inverter is going to say, oh, my input's high. I should put the output low. And so we're going to get a behavior like this. And we get this oscillating output. So this is something we can't describe with the truth table. There's not even an input to this, right? But the output bounces back and forth between 1 and 0. I used to have a picture of this. I don't think I do anymore. I'll have to wire this up and get some pictures for you. So this will oscillate. Well, it'll, it'll try to oscillate, but in practice, if you actually build this, if you take a 7404 and connect the output to the input, it doesn't do this. You just get some kind of like sloppy looking line. But if you build this circuit and hook it up to an oscilloscope, you'll actually see the output oscillate. Build that, hook an oscilloscope up right here and you'll see a bounce really fast, a few nanoseconds high, a few nanoseconds low. So we can make an output that, that wobbles around. That's not terribly useful. Here's a slightly different version. What do we think the output Y is going to be? Is it going to oscillate? I don't know. Let's make a timing diagram. Let's suppose that X is low. And let me label this intermediate point, I don't know, I'll just call it M for midpoint. And we'll make a diagram of M. Well, if X is low, what's the value of M? High. It's high. And if M is high, what's the value of Y? It's low. And that's connected to the input X, so X is still going to be low. M is going to be high. 
y is going to be low. This is going to go on forever. So if x is low, y is low. And it's going to stay low indefinitely. Now suppose I have an improperly wired switch which directly connects x to 5 volts when I close that switch. And suppose I close this switch for just really quick, close it and open it up again. So for a brief instant, x goes high. And then I pull the switch out before Izod walks by, so he doesn't see it. But right now, x is high. What's the value of m going to be? It's going to go low. And if m is low, y is going to go high. And that y is going to go back to x. x is going to stay high. m is going to stay low. y is going to stay high. This output's going to be a 1 forever now. Now suppose I have another switch connected to ground and I really quickly just touch that switch so it's closed and then open it up again. As soon as I connect this to ground, X gets pulled down to zero volts, which means I have zero volts going into my inverter, which means M becomes high. That gets inverted, which means Y becomes low. And now my output Y is low. So if I touch this switch momentarily to 5 volts, and then I take it away, my output is high. And if I touch this momentarily to ground and then take it away, my output becomes low. So this circuit has a memory. It's remembering what's the last switch that I closed. If the last switch that I closed was my red switch up here, my output is a 1. And if the output is zero, it means the last switch that I closed was this blue switch down here. So it's remembering past events. And that's the basis for how we're going to implement memories. There's one problem with doing it like this, though. This is not a, a good circuit for the health of the chips. Because when I connect this to ground, if this inverter is outputting a logic 1, the circuitry inside there is basically connecting the output to 5 volts. And I'm connecting that output to ground. I'm basically creating a little bit of a short. And over time, the components inside that inverter might actually get stressed and they might burn out. If I just connected this to ground and then went out for a coffee, right? it can damage the chip. Same thing if it's trying to put out 0 volts and I also connect that to 5 volts, that can short out the componentry in there. You could put a resistor in there, but if the resistor is big enough that you're not doing any damage, it may not be big enough to, to cause the input to be the logic level we want. So that's the right direction, though, right? We want to find some way to set this input to be high or low without just creating a short. And we're going to be able to do that pretty easily. We're going to come back to our NOR gate on Thursday and use some of the observations we made about NOR gates. If you have an input at a 0 or a 1, sometimes you can use that to force the output of that gate to be a 0 or a 1. So we're going to start with this, but we're going to modify it a little bit and come up with an actual um, configuration of circuitry that will let us store a 0 or a 1 indefinitely. And that's going to be the building block from which we build all of our sequential circuits. So we'll do that Thursday after, um, after the midterm. We'll get back to this. Um. All right, so uh, keep going on your homeworks. I will try to get your labs graded by Thursday, um, midterm at 12.10 on Thursday, and I will see you then. The stuff you just talked about was in the Minecraft thing that you made? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, once we get through that, we can, we can play with Minecraft.